you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the seven fallen houses in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the House of the Indigo Knight, The Fiends. Beautiful night out, isn't it? A little chilly, but nothing that you're not accustomed to. You know, what with you being dead inside and all. It was pretty sunny too, which doesn't mean much to you. Maybe it does, but knowing you will never walk in the sun again, it just makes me smile. I hear travel was difficult for your kind. You're bound to a city, unable to properly explore the wonders of the earth and the stars above. I bet that must kill you inside to be robbed of your freedom. Now, it won't surprise you to learn that we were put those there, you know, the stars, moon and planets that perform their astrological dance in space that were made by the angels and I just know you're dying to learn more. If not, well, treat it as a blanket for that inner turmoil for your blood-sucking existence. The weavers of the complex patterns of the known universe were orchestrated by the fourth house, the Nebiru, otherwise known by their more modern name, the fiends. They were once directing the course of the sun, the moon and stars that governed the seasons and portents of heaven. They were once oracles, dispensing wisdom and warnings, but now they use their powers of the night, dreams and visions to tap into unwary foes in their interlocking webs of madness, becoming masters of nightmares and curses. Those poor souls who seek secrets and forbidden knowledge are worthy of the house of spheres. No, this is not my house. Guess again. I can see you're still trying to work it out, and I'm curious to see if you ever get it. You probably won't, but I find it spooky that I know you oh so well, but that is neither here nor there at this time. To the surprise of absolutely no one, the Nebiru are driven by curiosity, and we all know what it does to cats, and indeed the house as a whole, but we'll get into that. They do feel the need to pursue unsolved mysteries, opposing themselves with investigations aplenty, which usually stems from an unforeseen chain of events that arises off the course of their actions. Most fiends would want to find the truth behind these fiends, forgetting to look at the bigger picture and getting lost in the moment. You may think they have laws to aid them in finding the truth, but on the contrary, their abilities allow the fae fabrics of creation to be their playthings. The law of light allows a Nebru to control the properties of light by creating blinding beams or elaborate illusions. I believe one of your vampiric powers can do things similar to this. The fallen who specialise in this are Shamash, the visage of light. The Shamash are creatures of stunning beauty, emanating hypnotic patterns of light from their forms. This light grants them various abilities such as improved night vision and the power to influence and avoid attacks. High Torment Shamash, on the other hand, channel their rage into terrifying illusions, extra attacks and distractions. Well, extra attacks in the sense that your lot can move fucking quickly. Unlike other angels who had a natural connection to light, the Shamash only emerged after the rebellion, driven by their desire to aid humanity in harnessing the power of a light. The light, I should say. Although they did not create light, they mastered it, moulding it into various forms and colours and collaborating with other angels to bring light to their creations. During the rebellion, the Shamash were excerpts in deception, using their light to distract and mislead, but in the end, it proved futile. Trapped in the abyss without light, the Shamash took physical form for the first time, and they were overjoyed to finally escape. The law of patterns allows a Nebru to manipulate times in ways both subtle, such as causing apparent serendipity, to outright slowing or stopping the time flow. They can also read the patterns of the heavens, telling the future and enabling them to alter it. In less words, the fiend has a great perception of manipulation of time than most. The facade of patterns belongs to those of the Ninsern, who possess intricate patterns and symbols that have been both around longer than recorded history. Their bodies are often perfectly symmetrical and some have wings. High Torment Ninsern, however, experiences darkening patterns and skin along with empty voids for eyes and they appear distant and unfocused. Despite growing extra arms, they maintain their symmetry. 
The Ninsan spent countless eras organising the universe and creating the rules of existence, science and ethics. However, after the fall, they became uncertain for the first time. Many modern Ninsan attempt to return to the universe to its old order to prevent any damage. It's speculated that God destroyed their meticulous order to prevent the rebellious Ninsan from using their abilities for Lucifer and the other fallen. As a fun trivial fact for you, Ninsan was the name of a Sumerian goddess, the mother of the hero Gilgamesh. Finally, we have the Law of Portals. This allows the Fallen to travel easily between places by making easily accessible and altering dimensions. They can also use their powers to hamper the traverse of others. Those who specialise in this law are Nedu, the visage of portals. They are often described as distant, with wings and glowing eyes that sense supernatural energies. When their torment levels rise, they become monstrous and their darkness deepens. They seem to become living shadows, almost ephemeral. The Nedu were created to assist the Ninsan in their work and create pathways and become skilled at creating locks and mystical wards. They even use shadows for travel, although that knowledge has been lost, so I'm told. With their ability to go anywhere, the Nedu had an extensive knowledge of Earth. During the rebellion, their skill in creating ways into various realms made them valuable allies, but also led to their downfall as one of their own may have designed the gates into the abyss. Modern Nedu remain distant from humans but they may still find uses for humanity. But that would be some time in the making as the creation of humanity had to come first. The fourth house would stand by the crater side and watch God create the stars and worlds that would hang, hang like jewels in the forever emptiness. But these are more than gems just sitting there. They acted with each other, fitting into their own place. It was much more than just existence. Everything had a function, like clockwork, remember that. Their mandate was not of creation, but regulation, engineers of the cosmos, keeping the machine running, so to speak. From as large as orbiting planets to decaying isotopes, the Nebiru calibrated and bound everything together. They would become masters of indirect influence as they altered seasonal patterns with the beat of a bird's wings on the other the planet or the motion of the oceans with the ionic bursts of the sun's warmth. When I say they watched everything, I seriously do mean everything. Of course, at the time we all viewed them as silent observers whilst we did all the work. Well. Not all of us did, but you get what I mean. In a sense, this is true, but maintaining universe calibrations is no small feat. Something I don't think your tiny head even understands, let alone comprehend. Or was it the other way around? Anyway, the fiends were the first scholars, scientists and philosophers. They naturally had to ask and explore why things worked the way they did in order for the universe not to implode in of itself, or whatever would have happened if they left it all unattended. They silently contemplated it and all of Tyrael, thrown of the indigo expanse spun the cosmos into motion. He and his deputies would work on the eternal record to allow those to map and record it all. This book took the form of the Edict of Memory. Tyriel and his chosen deputies, Kusiel, Gemor, Yisriel, Abishar, Osir and Osimadeus formed the Sigil, who would govern a volatile web of correspondence, maintaining a constant flow of information across the gear in often to maintain accuracy and clarity. As one might expect, it ran perfectly, maintained with metronomic precision. The first test the fourth house would face would come in the form of the fifth house, the Lamassu, otherwise known as the Tefilers, but you knew that already because we talked about them not that long ago. You may remember that their methods are, in comparison to the Nebiru, are chaotic. They would add connections to where they were none before and break older ones as and when they needed to. To say it brought a sense of horror to Tyrio and the Vigil would be a large understatement. Not only did it bring winds of change that showed no sign of abating, but it would provide difficulties for the Nebru to uphold God's instructions. A third of the house, under the guise of the Edict of Instance, was set to reverse the creativity of the Lamassu, but for every one thing that was changed, several more would take their place. Reluctantly, Tyria would instruct them to oversee the bigger picture, which would quickly enter a state of equilibrium with the rest of creation. This would bring uncertainty to Tyria and the Vigil, as they had come to learn that the universe thrived on change, nothing would remain certain anymore. 
The second challenge would come from the fauna and flora spread by the sixth house, the Rabasu, further taxing the Nebiru's attention. Tyrio and the Visual withheld the despair of the situation. The creation of the seventh house, the Halaku, creators of entropy and death, complicated things further as death left empty space, yes but also new relationships and feelings. Death to the Nebiru is not the end but a new set of variables to learn. The breaking point however would come with the creation of humanity, the supposed guiding of hand of the universe's resources. They were made to dream, conceive and build, shaping the ideas according to their own will. The Nebiru saw this as the ultimate threat to the stability of the cosmos. To that end, they believed that the less humanity knew about the rich potential to the paradise, the better it would be for everything, no matter how clumsy their primitive ways were. Such behaviours made the humans quite easy to predict as well they were as many are now, habitual and declined the means to invent and challenge the status quo. Asmodeus was the one who prophesied the idea of being able to predict their movements, the future of the mortals to uphold the grand design set up by God. And so the Vigil issued the third and final edict, the Edict of Momentum which created the oracles, angels whose sole function was to see into the future and look for threats to the grand design. It broadened the scope of the authority of the Vigil and thus their role in life and their overall shape as a house via the instruction of God. With time, the threads of the web would disintegrate and more focus was placed on the oracles and none of the other diviners and sources. The Vigil questioned the faults of this, whether something was miscalculated or some other error they had committed. This would birth the Edict of Silence, as the delivery of information would be delivered exclusively to the Archangel Asmodeus. The clamping down, however, would soon create the thing the house wanted to avoid. They concluded that it was mankind's ignorance that was causing the cosmos to implode on itself, rather than blame their autistic asses. The Alumel stated that manipulating humanity was the only way to prevent the Nebru threads from breaking, but this landed on deaf ears. Some have suspected that Tyrion and the Vigil knew the exact nature of the fall but kept this from his house, and I suspect the only one who would know about the truth is Asmodeus, but as he is an earthbound now, so you could you were never going to find out the truth basically, so your guess is as good as mine. The Nebiru would have become incredibly isolated, not just from the other Elohim, but themselves, which would cement Aramel's feelings more, but no idea how to address it at first, due to the isolation from humanity, they choose to upkeep. Aramel's decision to reveal his secrets to a select few Elohim was the first rebellious act amongst the Elohim, something that not even Lucifer will ever claim. His intentions to keep it small was not to last, as this was the great debate after all, which sent reverberations throughout the host, shaking the core of all of us. There wasn't much time to think about it either, as when Lucifer raised the banner, we marched. The realisation that many of the Nebru had been deceived encouraged them to take up the fight, which was the first spontaneous action had they ever made. The catalytism, or however that fucking word's pronounced, of all creation was nigh, and they were the ones riding the war horses of its apocalypse. It focused on Lucifer's disobedience and humanity that would forever weigh on the soul of every fiend, as it resulted on the hold of the host twisting the webs of creation beyond the point of repair. During the fall, many Nebru were aligned with the Silver Legion under Asmodeus, rarely acting as a house, as the shattered trust made by Tyria was too great. The fiends who participated became advisors and strategists, with the information of communication flowed with Asmodeus's creator control no longer just a passive voice, but a varied house that can be an active change in the universe. The murder of Abel, as in, you know, from the Bible, darkened their hearts and their abuse of their purpose, changed the greater design and ended up losing the war, with the information the spies and oracles of fiends collected by Asmodeus to create the Nephilim spawned from the mortals many would soon rape. They had questions that would never get answers as they sat in the abyss for what felt like a fucking eternity. The fear of escaping hell did not prevent them from escaping and experiencing new feelings, however. The Nebiru are cold, calculating creatures, ones that are not accustomed to the warmth of the human bodies, filled with things like hormones that overwhelmed the fiends. Of course, this wasn't the only thing they had to quickly adjust to, as the world they had created 
look like shit. The void of the Elohim that won the war and the disbelief in God. When you put it like that, it makes you think what the fucking point of it all was. Aramel was supposed to be the first of the fiends to escape, residing in, I believe, Atlanta, Georgia of all places? Recruiting as many as he could find, partly to help him through this new experience, but also to start up the Cryptics faction. He believes there will be a war between the factions soon, and he intends on winning. It won't surprise you that most Nebiru are aligned with this faction. The pursuit of these shards of knowledge is merely a distraction from the inevitable inward examination that leads many fiends to the Raveners. That said, almost no fiend believes the destruction of creation is a good thing. Some fiends become reconcilers, as they have always been so distant from heaven and earth despite the fact that paradise has never been truly their home. Similarly, some still believe in the manipulation of humanity that is so common for the Faustian faction, with the angle that controlling their destiny is another course to be charted and directed. Other fiend Faustians see the humanity in its current state as an enormously complex organism that is equal to their cosmos, and thus a worthy successor of their skills. And if you were curious, the second most popular faction of the Nebiru is the Luciferian, probably due to some loyalty to him when the war was at its worst, protecting them from recrimination. Aramel is the only prominent voice amongst the Nebiru. Most have become very political with their knowledge acquiring, building their own power bases and assuming more familiar background positions, making themselves important and vital in this sense. This is how many fiends behave, which is almost sad really, especially when you consider there are some that may wish to return to those dark times at the time of atrocities and more powerful Nebiru have yet to return and they will probably wish to forge their power and authority from all the fallen. The existence of the Nebiru has been one of deviation, obedience and observation. They have tasted the juices of power and they want more, now entwined with the souls of man, woman and everyone else in between, and the world they have now is a great oyster of possibilities. Sure, I, a fallen, can dream about shaping the world to our liking and so can your vampiric princes and princesses, but the House of the Indigo Knight can assure it. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.